This episode of Muddy River Gems is brought to you by Dot Foods. I think what it comes down to is the culture and the people. Our culture here at Dot is like no other. I've never experienced anything like what I've lived with for the last 12 years. Dot is very diverse. It is truly a family-owned business, but it is a family inside and out. You always feel like you matter and you play a big hand in the pot. There's so many opportunities to make a difference at DOT and really contribute to the success of the organization. One of Quincy's older companies is turning 125 years old this year. Coming up on Muddy River Gems, brought to you by DOT Foods, join us for a tour of Hollister Whitney. Ed Trone, it's a big year for Hollister Whitney. This, this is a, a historic company in Quincy, started in 1899, and this is the 125th year. And I have to say, you're still going strong. You still employ about almost 400 people here, don't you? It's, we're still going strong. It's yeah. been 125 years. We have a lot of great employees here that have helped grow the business and keep the business going. And we've got a bright future ahead of us to continue to grow that business. It's changed a lot because when it started in 1899, it was downtown, I think on 2nd Street. Yep. It lived there for a long time. It did. But uh, it, couldn't, it just couldn't handle what you need to do here because what you're doing here is very, very modern production. Correct, yeah. Down on 2nd Street, it was about 50,000 uh, square feet and, and around 1980, 81, we, we put this building up here and it's 100,000 square feet to start with. Mm -hmm. And then in 1986, we continued to grow. So we, we added a test tower here in the front. And then in 1988, we added 30,000 square feet more to the west. And then up in 97, we grew even more and we added the, the big test tower, the 100 foot test tower and another 55,000 square feet. Well, let, let's walk that way so we can get a look at this tower because uh, it's interesting. It's not only there to, so you can get a good view. It's there so that you can test your products, isn't it? Correct, yes. It's a working tower. We test products from our business. We also test products from some of our sister companies mm -hmm. um, owned by Vantage. And we're going to go up in that tower later in the program. Like I say, it's quite a view, but you also get a chance to see how elevator equipment works on your way up. And you can kind of describe to us yep. what, what exactly is going on. Yeah. But during this program, also, you're going to take us on a tour of the plant. And then uh, a co-worker of yours is going to show us some of the historical and, and some of the more modern things that, have, that are made here. And we'll get a chance to go in the tool room and maybe talk to an employee there. So I want to thank you for having us in. And like I say, 125 years, that's a, that's a heritage. That's a, that's a big deal. Pretty amazing. Yes, it is. And we appreciate you guys coming in too. Thank you. Otis Watts, uh, you, you've been working here for what, 20? 28, 28 years. years? Okay, 28 so years. You've, seen, you've seen a lot of this too because you not only work in the tool room, but you've also worked out in the production. So Correct. you know how all this all this sort of works together. Yes. What you do in here is you try to keep all that out there going. I guess it's <laughs> part of it, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, we we do a lot of things in here. Like I said earlier, we, we uh, make a lot of uh, dies. We make fixtures. We repair parts. Uh, we make parts to keep our machines going. Uh, yeah, we do a lot of things in here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You and a couple hundred other people. Yes, yes, place. obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's a major employer, has been in Quincy yes. for a long time. 125 and the 125 years. Yes. anniversary is coming up, which is great. Can you take us in, and I'm not going to ask you to do anything that, that is going to uh, you know, affect what you need to do to set up, but can you take us and show us your equipment and yeah. show us how it works? Um, First of all, we have our mill. A lot of this is, uh, you know, we do a lot of boring, uh, threading, uh, specialty work. Uh, we make flats on here, uh, production and everything. Um, and then the next, some things, we also use our lathes over here, which is kind of messy right now. Uh, we turn shafts down here. And so the also, lathe, that's, that's the, okay, so what you'll do is you'll put a block of, not a block, but a piece of, metal on that lathe and it'll turn it and then you can make the shape you want i guess correct that sort of the correct any kind of profile that you want on it mm -hmm. uh depending on the tooling we have um basically this is a chuck and 
right now this is a, a sleeve for one of our products. It's just for a spacer, basically. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we stick it in our lathes. And if I wanted to cut down to size, I go off the print that we have that is sent down from engineering to give us the right dimension and we cut it to that dimension. Okay, so th and when you say sh it would shave off the outside, Correct. so it would make it smaller. It would, it would smaller, face right? this, and if you wanted mm -hmm. to cut the OD, you could cut that as yeah. well and also bore it. That's incredible, the power of that equipment, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. What about over here? Uh, it's the same thing, it's just a smaller mm -hmm. version. Uh, you know, we hold tolerances within, you know, tens of thousands in here. Um, I know that's kind of hard to, to imagine what a thousand is, but the human hair is about four thousandths thick. Wow, okay. So if that gives you an idea of of how precise we are. Mm -hmm. uh, back here we have a grinder, which is a precision where we could grind it down within a tenth of a thousandths. <laughs> Wow. Okay, well, you know, when you expect your elevator to stop and not get stuck, you want to be exact, right? You want to be perfectly absolutely. exact. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, just, it's about the same as uh, the automotive industry, you know. They they have really tight tolerances, and we as well. We yeah. just, we're the vertical transportation. <laughs> so you, you've finished some sleeves over here. These are ready to go out, I guess, huh? Correct. And do you have any idea what they'll be used for? They, they're the same thing. They're basically a sleeve. They're a spacer for, or... Uh, for machinery, mm -hmm. you know, it, whatever dimension that comes down from uh, engineering, that's what we cut it to. Mm -hmm. 28 years is a long time at one place. Have you seen many changes? I've seen a lot of changes actually, uh, a lot of uh, updated equipment. We still have some older equipment that does a really good job, but over the last uh, probably three to, well, especially probably in the last five years, we've, uh, we've what, purchased two new machines. We're getting a new machine in, uh, I believe at the end of August, I'm not 100% sure yeah. on that, but that's another state-of-the-art machine yeah. that should help us be more efficient. And the, the state-of-the-art keeps changing and getting better yes. and better, doesn't yes. it? Yes, yeah. so it's a, it's a definitely a challenge to, uh, you know, you gotta do some research and uh, figure out the things that you need to do to get the job done. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for visiting with well, us. Well, I appreciate it, Mark. <laughs> Ed Trone, you make the parts that keep elevators running throughout throughout the country and I, I asked you to take us to one that would sort of illustrate what it is that you do in a large way tell us what's going on here all right so so this machine here it's uh it's called a, an 8800 a mazak 8800 we purchased this about a year and a half ago and what we do on this piece of equipment is we machine these housings this housing is what goes on what we call a machine a machine is what actually powers the elevator to go up and down and there's different sizes of machines based on how fast the elevator needs to go, how much weight it needs to be able to move up and down. But we used to have these outsourced. A, co a company in Southern Illinois used to machine these for us. Mm -hmm. Because this is a product that's growing in volume, it's a newer product that we're really pitching to sell and grow the business, we decided to invest in this piece of equipment and bring this back to, our, back to Quincy mm -hmm. so we could machine this here. What we do here is we machine this upper housing we machine the lower housing, then we bolt the two together and do all the bores and stuff. What, what, what's he doing right now? He just closed that door on that piece yep. of it. So he's loading, he loads the raw castings into the machine. Okay. And then when they come out, they're fully machined, ready to go to the next step of the process. Okay, you said you've had this piece of equipment for a year or two? About two years. About yep. two years. Are you showing a profit with it yet? Are we, you making? We are, we made, we were able to cut the cost um, by more than 50% wow. by bringing it in, in house and sourcing mm -hmm. it. Now it's high tech too, because look, he's over there now, he's demanding what's gonna happen, isn't he? That's correct. So if you, if you see along the back part of the machine, there's a carousel and it has different fixtures and tooling in it. And he can load over here and then it goes down and then it feeds into the machine. Then when it's done, it feeds back and he offloads it. Wow. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay, Ed, we're seeing the evolution of the product here, aren't we? Correct. We, is this what we just saw? This is what we just saw being machined on the last piece of equipment yeah. that we talked about, the housing. And this housing goes on, this, this unit when it's fully assembled is what we call a machine. And that's actually what provides the power to move the elevator up and down using cables. Uh -huh. And so there's different sizes um, and different configurations based on the application and what the customer needs, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where a lot of our custom work comes in. Not all of them are all the same. Some have 
bigger traction wheels. Some have bigger, smaller motors. Some of them have different bases on them to fit the configuration of the building. You have to be a very nimble company to be able to handle these kinds of orders. Yes. Is that what all this is about, is having these specialty locations where these guys are able to, to make different parts on different machines? Absolutely. So we have to be very flexible. Like you said, I would say 80 to 85% of our orders are made to order, meaning they're custom for whatever application they're going in. Thankfully, we have a very talented set of people that they they understand all these configurations and they're able to assemble them on the same line. So we assemble all different configurations down this one production and, and, line. And is this the production line that yep, we're talking yep. about here? This roller conveyor line is a production line. It's similar to what you'd see in an automotive line where the machines index one station at a time. You see all these, these pendants down here, they push the button and it goes to the next station. An operator performs the work that's supposed to happen at that station when they're complete. They push the button and it goes on to the next station. On a normal day, how many machines would you pump out of here? So we'll do 12 to 16 machines a day. It varies a little bit on the mix because we'll show you some of the big machines. They're much larger. They take a little bit more time. Yeah. But uh, 12 to 16 a day is pretty normal for us. Wow. Well, Ed, we were talking about the size of machines. That's a big one right here. This is a big one. These, these two machines right here are some of our bigger ones. This one's bigger because it has, it's called an OD machine. It has an overhead deflector and that's a custom build to be able to reroute cables inside the hoistway to accommodate the customer's building. Um, okay. This this machine... So, so this, is, this, this is a unit, yep, and this is going to go in, in in one piece. That's exactly right. Okay. This will go in as one piece, and this is basically what powers the elevator up and down. As this motor rotates, it turns this traction wheel, and the cables ride inside of these grooves. In one direction, the elevator goes up. When the motor goes, the, the machine goes the other direction, the elevator comes down. Okay. And that's a big one there too. This is this is our largest model called a 74, and it's mostly used for um, freight and cargo type elevators. It's got a very high weight capacity. Not a fast machine, but it's got a high weight capacity. Mm -hmm. We'll be back with more from Hollister Whitney on Muddy River Gems, brought to you by Dot Foods. From our trucks to their lunch trays, to your local hospital, to your favorite pub, and to your kitchen table. For more than 60 years, Dot Foods and Dot Transportation have been stocking the shelves of your hometown. Sure, we've grown a lot, but at our core, we're still small town, family run businesses that care about our communities and the people who keep us running. Join the Dot family today and be part of something bigger why work at that? You could list out individual qualities forever. There's a lot of opportunities. They take care of the employees. They take care of the community. So our pay, our benefits, it's competitive. Time off, tons of flexibility. They're willing to work with you to help you advance. It's not unusual for you to get a flat, head, a flat bed of steel in every yes. day, I'll bet. Yeah. We get several shipments a week of steel. We use about half a million pounds of steel every month throughout the business wow. for various products. Wow, okay, and then that turn, of course, it's in various sizes and yep. shapes too, but then you, you cut it and, and, and machine it for whatever you're gonna need, but that's what's going on here, is that Correct. Right? So we basically get almost everything in in 40-foot sticks, so 40-foot lengths. Then we, we stage it here and then it gets loaded into a saw. And when the operator gets a work order, it'll have a blueprint in there. It'll tell them what lengths to cut and what size of material to cut. They'll do that. They batch it or kit it up and then it'll go to the next step of the process. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ed, you go to all this trouble to manufacture these machines and these parts, but unless you get them packaged up right to go to the right place, none of it matters. That's does exactly it? That's, right. It's shipping areas. For That's it. right. So we have a very skilled group of folks here that they're able to pull these orders together, get them packaged and bundled up like the customer wants. Then we arrange a freight company to pick it up. Sometimes we call the customer, they arrange their own freight. The way it works is every order that we get from a customer has what we call a contract number. There might be four items on the contract or 400, it, it depends, right? So once this contract is here, we distribute prints 
and work orders to the various areas of the shop floor. They build their product when it's finished. It comes back to this area and gets staged. Once every line item on that order is closed or complete, then the order goes to the shipping supervisor and he pulls his team together and they start kitting everything up and getting it ready to go out the door. Okay, so it's all packaged in the most in the most handleable way. Correct. So what it goes on the truck, it's all together. You're yep. not having to look around anymore. It's all exactly. there. Exactly. And it knows where to go. The driver knows where to yep. go with. And we actually take pictures of the orders too, so we can make sure that everything's on there. Mm -hmm. Okay, Ed, we're on our way up to the test tower. We're in the test tower, yep. on our way to the, to the top. The penthouse. Yep, the penthouse, seven stories up. But we're going to see part of this equipment that you all make yep. and rely on here on our way up. Yeah, a lot of the structural stuff that you're going to see here, we make, we manufacture this. Yeah. The slings, the, the shivs, the, that round piece that has the cables running it, we mm -hmm. manufacture that here. These little wheels that are called roller guides that ride on the rail of the car, mm -hmm. we manufacture those here. This platform that we're standing on, we manufacture platforms okay. here of all different sizes. Mm -hmm. Are you going to get in the cable business anytime soon? We have not yet. We have a pretty good partner that we get it from right now. Uh-huh. Don't need to. Huh? Nope. It'd be pretty warm up there, I suspect. Oh, it's yes, it is. Real yeah. Now, why do we call this the test tower? So we we have this so we can test new products. We can test design changes. Um, Doug and his team install stuff in here, equipment. Like we've got a new product coming out, or even sometimes we're validating a new vendor that's providing a component for one of our one of our products. We'll put it in the tower and test it to make sure it meets mm -hmm. all of our requirements and our customers' requirements. Perfect. No, why don't you give us, a, Ed, give us a tour around here. And... So there's, you, uh, in the panels you see on the walls, those are the controllers. We have other business units as part of the Vantage companies that, that manufactures these. They send them here, we use them. Mm -hmm. um, we also test them if they're making changes or, or new designs. What you see here is this is the machine. We, we saw this built right. on the shop floor. Right. This is a gearless one that we talked about. We didn't see one on the floor, but this is a gearless machine. So it doesn't have the electric motor like the uh, traditional geared traction machines mm -hmm. have. But basically as it turns this wheel, it moves these cables and it lifts the car up and down. And there's basically two configurations. You can have it in the penthouse or you can have it in the basement of the building, depending on the design of the building mm -hmm. and the hoistway. So you choose the, the penthouse here. We I would suspect penthouse. it'd be easier to get this equipment in a basement than well, it would in a penthouse. But. So the car he rode up on, the car he rode up on is a basement. Yep. So it, it depends, right? Like, so a machine like this, it may go in a penthouse and they may hoist it in with a, a helicopter or a big crane. Um, the basement, sometimes you're a little bit more restricted just because of your access may not be big enough to get actually mm -hmm. things in there. Mm -hmm. Mike Gash, um, you're the chief estimator, right? Mm -hmm. So when a company comes to you for an estimate on a sales job, you're gonna produce a piece of equipment for them. Um, that, that's what you do. You and your team make sure that you can do the specs and you can do the estimates and you can pr uh, make a, a, a sort of promotion to them and whether they want to buy the equipment or not. Yeah, we, we read through the specs, architectural, structural drawings, come up with a plan to sell them equipment that we manufacture here in our Quincy mm -hmm. plant. And have been manufacturing for 125 years. That is correct. Hollister Whitney. That, that's really a pretty remarkable anniversary, I think. Right. Yeah. yeah. Why are we standing next to this 1920s traction machine? Because this is the oldest example we have of what was being built about that time. Right. Yes. This was originally they referred to this as a winding engine. This was pulled out of one of our, some old building here in, in Quincy. Um, but yeah, this, this was what we were making at that time, drum, a drum style brake, uh, still using the type of motor. Uh, this would have been a, like a single speed AC motor and mm -hmm. type of control for this, uh, using relays for the, the braking system. Okay, so this was, this was moving the car up and down, an elevator right. shaft, and, and show me where the rope or, or the cables would have been, would have been attached. Your, your cables would have gone right through here. This would drop straight down to the car. This, was, this would come off deflected at an angle to what they call a deflector shiv, which would go down to your counterweight. Counterweighting being approximately 40% counterbalance to an empty car. It worked, the, the balance works about the same if you've got a full car, a 2,500 pound capacity, usually a seven by five platform, 
you can probably have an occupancy of 12 people within that platform. Well, that's if, pretty if crowded. Can, yeah, it would be it would be very <laughs> yeah. crowded. So a 22 foot rise, and this was powered by electricity. Yes. Okay. So before elect before electricity was readily available, there were no elevators. I guess they weren't using steam or anything like that, were they? Uh, I believe that they they probably had steam powered uh, equipment at that time. Really? But yeah, this okay. was. This yeah. was the, the forefront of, as a matter of fact, I'm thinking, I'm not sure, <laughs> but I'm thinking that uh, one of the brothers, either Hollister or Whitney, may have had something involved with steam mm -hmm. engines mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah, well, in 1899, the when, they, when they founded the company, right. n there wasn't electricity everywhere. If they were going to have an elevator, they would have had to power it with something, or yeah. maybe internal combustion, I don't know. But. Yeah. Yeah, fascinating though. I mean, this is this would have been really at the forefront at the time. I would I suspect, that and they were correct. building these down in the old plant, the Hollister Whitney plant, which was downtown. Right, see, right. Second Street. Second Street, I believe. Uh -huh. Yeah, and they operated down there in what th through World War Two. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, and uh, during World War Two, um, because at that time we were making hydraulic equipment, hydraulic being different from this, mm -hmm. that was. Uh, more of the, and before of course, then electric, you know, we had the, the pumping units with fluid in them that, mm -hmm. would, to, that would go to a cylinder to uh, pump fluid into the cylinder, raise it up, and allow it to come back into that unit to allow it to lower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, yeah, and so during World War II, it's interesting, you sort of reformatted the work that you were doing to support the war effort. Yes, uh, getting to back into the pumping units, we were making the cylinders for the elevators, and with the cylinder, uh, we were making uh, retooled to make gun turrets for warships. Wow! Wow! So okay. of course the walls being the wall thickness within that turret being yeah. a lot thicker than what we would use in a plunger tube for mm -hmm. a hydraulic machine, yeah. but. Let, let's yeah. walk into the present day. We have some products over here that you're that you're still making. I, I didn't know this, but I assumed an elevator company built their elevators. But the fact is, they they come to companies like Hollister Whitney to provide them with the parts they need to put the elevators together. Right. Um, we're not the cookie cutter company. We've always we've always done things as a specialty. So a lot of the companies uh, were able to come up with just a simple solution within a scope of say like a 2500 or 350 seven by five platform if you wanted something that was a little bit different you wanted a corner post or which normally elevators are side posts mm -hmm. but if you wanted a corner post or you wanted say instead of a seven by five you wanted a six by six platform well we were the ones that would come up with the mm -hmm. solutions to provide that specialty type of equipment that Otis and Kone and Schindler, other major suppliers, didn't have mm -hmm. or want to fool around with, mm -hmm. if you will. So mm -hmm. that was our niche in the market yeah. at that time. Yeah. Well, come on in here and let's let's look at some of these. I don't even know what a rope gripper well, is, but maybe you can describe to us. Sure. What a rope gripper was a, a product um, by one of our former uh, owners of the company invented this. This was a safety, is a safety device that's used to grip the cables in case uh, if the car were to uh, over travel the floor or something to keep somebody from walking into a platform and tripping, say it didn't level out quite right, okay. uh, any other issues that if it were to creep up while somebody was trying to climb into it. Mm -hmm. What this would do is, and if there's a power outage or something to that effect, this immediately right in here clamps over the ropes to stop it immediately. And, and you can reset it through a pumping unit uh, to uh, free it up so mm -hmm. that people aren't trapped in a car. But this is a, ah. a safety device come up with, I believe, uh, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s that uh, was yeah. there in place to provide an additional piece of safety that wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move up here. These are big, <clears throat> these are big items. These are also geared traction machines and these are, pr you're producing these here at Hollister Whitney. This, 
this today, is, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, today. This is this. Um, other than the other machines that you'll see with what uh, is referred to as a, a foot-mounted motor, you'll see feet that come off of the bottom of the motor and mount the bed plate comes out. In this instance, this is called a flange mount motor. This makes it easier for a customer to disassemble, take it up into a machine room because in a lot of cases we do what they refer to as a modernization. It's not always just a new building that goes up. There are existing buildings with existing stairways with uh, mm -hmm. difficult conditions to get a machine into. They have to disassemble this machine and try to, to get it up somehow either on the platform if it's light enough or they have to have a team of men that have to actually yeah. carry this or the next option is that they actually have to have a crane outside and you'll see in the New York area there's a lot of times where they'll block off the streets. Right. They'll have a huge crane out there that's lifting one of these machines oh, okay. up and over and dropping it into a machine room mm -hmm. at the top landing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now there so, are machines that are also in the basement level. So as as we stand right here and if uh, in a if you had a tower well above us, uh, you would have one right no next door to you that would have the ropes going up over some shivs and then down into the hoistway mm -hmm. to get to the car into the counterweight. Okay. Now, what are these machines over here? These are gearless machines. These are intended for high speed jobs and also uh, in tight, very tight conditions where mm -hmm. they can use a very small machine. Okay. Very this would not be a seven person car elevator. Oh, this would be oh a most definitely. These go oh, up would. to 5,000 pound capacity, really? okay. which could wow. be a, a six by 10 platform. That's a, that's a powerful machine there. Yeah, it really is. And you can pack it into a small, <clears throat> a small bundle. And it is because it's two to one roping. When you two to one rope a job, that means the machine itself sees half the capacity at twice the speed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's and, why you can get by with a smaller machine. And these are machine. all just different examples and different sizes of the same, the same function. Right. Okay. This is what they would call <coughs> a double wrap machine. Again, this would be used in a very high speed condition. The smaller machine there, uh, we would use up to 500 feet per minute. This machine, we would use up to uh, 800. We ha actually have another machine that'll go up to 1,000. Wow. But what you have here is you would have a shiv either to this side or the other side, a deflector shiv again, but we do call it a secondary. But in that instance, what you have is you have ropes coming down to that shiv that wrap around that shiv, come back through on opposing grooves, go back through that shiv on opposing grooves and then down to the counterweight. Mm -hmm. Oh, you were talking about a thousand feet per minute. There, there, it, there it is, is, right there. There it is. Okay, now let's see, I wanna go, I wanna go over here because I know your company didn't make this, but one of the companies is under your umbrella, your sister companies did. Yeah, the Vantage uh, Group. When, when, when we walk up to a, 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 an elevator door, Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at something totally different, but this is what's inside. This is what you don't see. Right, uh, the door operator up here. So yeah, uh, essentially when the car reaches the landing and you've got magnets and other indicators that uh, uh, allow for this door to open, now you're traveling on this car, this will not open. Movies that you watch where people try to jimmy doors and, mm -hmm. and do things like that. There are far too many safety features within an elevator. The, the, the going out through the roof of a cab as an example. Mm -hmm. No, you're <laughs> locked in there. You have to wait for somebody to come down to the top of the car and unlock that little little door or you know above the, yeah. the cab to get out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, don't, don't trust what you see in movies. <laughs> okay, and let's, let's just end up over here because um, I, I think we can we can all relate to. The, of course, your company didn't make this either. Uh, elevator controls made it, but this right. is what this is. You face an elevator, you push the button, but this is what else you don't see. Right. The the control portion of it, it's I guess you could say, is the brains behind telling the machine when to operate, wow. where to travel to, you know, what floor you're going to, mm -hmm. and the logic behind what's used within that is is how. You can have like uh, more than one call at a time, and it's got to consider either the traffic, you know, what's previously built into this, the traffic 
coming into traffic, meaning the amount of people that use this elevator every day, and even by a time schedule, as to when I press this button and I want to go and I'm on the first floor and I want to go to the fifth floor, what happens if somebody's on the second floor and they've pressed this button? Mm -hmm. And then you've got somebody that's, that's on the ninth floor that's pressed this button. So is it going to go all the way up to the ninth floor, then drop everybody off on the way back down? Is it going to stop on the second floor, drop you off, go to the mm -hmm. third floor, drop somebody else off, then get to the ninth floor? That's when you see the arrows. Um, I don't see it on here, but when you see the arrows for the up or down, it's just like you press, you see a duplex car. I mean, you know, you got a group of two cars yeah. together. You press that button, you see the red top arrow or you see the white bottom arrow. Well, you usually know that if you're going to the fifth floor and that lights up with a white light, meaning it's going down, you're going to go down to that floor mm -hmm. before you get back up mm -hmm. to your car. So it's mm -hmm. better to just wait till yeah. you see the arrow in the direction that you're going mm -hmm. to get on the car then. Yeah. And you don't have to press the button 40 times. To, <laughs> it, it, once you've pressed it once, it's already registered. Artificial intelligence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Well, you're quite welcome. Every business has its ups and downs. At 125-year-old Hollister Whitney, that's a good thing. With another Muddy River Gem brought to you by Dot Foods, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. This episode of Muddy River Gems was brought to you by Dot Foods.